Today I want to begin with two illustrations, and they both come from, from nature. The first one I watched on a, a YouTube video, and I have to tell you, I was kind of disturbed by it. It kind of frustrated me. And it has to do with the, the cuckoo bird. I know that's silly, but it, it did disturb me. And here's why. This is the uh, infant cuckoo, the big bird. And then you have the adoptive sparrow, the, the mother, that is feeding this big, huge bird. So why would the little bird be feeding this big, monstrous, oversized bird? Well, here's the reason. The cuckoo secretly sneaks in. Is this popping? The, uh, the, the cuckoo secretly sneaks in the nest and lays an egg in there. And so when the sparrow comes back, the sparrow doesn't know that one of the eggs has been planted there by the cuckoo. It's a stealth operation, you might say. But here, instinctively, whenever the cuckoo hatches, it hatches first every time. And the first thing it does, it instinctively, is removes all of the, of the eggs. Just pushes them, levers them up and knocks them out, out of the nest before they have a chance to hatch. And so when the sparrow comes back, there's just one egg that has hatched, and it's the cuckoo, and the sparrow thinks it is her child, is her, her baby. So because of that, this one cuckoo, this forgery of an offspring is there in the nest, and so the mother and the father sparrow work themselves to death, to exhaustion, to cater to this huge adopted baby who is unsatiable in appetite. And there is the cuckoo. Now see, aren't you disturbed too? I knew you would be. It's terrible. So that's the first one. Now the next example is one that's a hard touching story and this concerns this dog. It's a terrible picture because it's a very old picture. This is Hakito. The golden brown Akita belonging to a professor at Tokyo Imperial University. He commuted daily to work and Hakito went to greet him at the end of each day at the nearby train station. The pair continued this daily routine until May of 1925 when the professor did not return because during one of his lectures he had a cerebral hemorrhage and uh, he died without ever returning to the, to the station. Each day for the next nine years, nine months, and 15 days, Hakito awaited his master's return, appearing precisely when the train was due at the station. Hakito became a national sensation, as you can see memorialized in this statue that was made. His faithfulness to his master's memory impressed the people of Japan as a spirit of family loyalty, which all should strive to achieve. So there we have two examples. And although these animals respond instinctively, when it comes to selfishness and unselfishness, it's something that we humans choose. We can choose to live a life that's just about taking, that's about underhanded things, that's about myself. Or we can choose to be selfless and to serve others and to give ourselves to Jesus. Nature teaches us then these lessons of selfishness and selflessness. Unlike these animals, we humans may choose which of these two paths to follow. Now in last week's lesson, it was a list lesson. We had a list lesson in the morning and a list lesson in the evening. And the reason it was a list lesson is because Paul made a list. And in that list from last week, we fully explored what it looks like to be selfish. And if we go with our own human instincts, probably that's the path we'll take because we tend to be a little selfish and commercials and advertising and even living in the world pushes us more in the direction of being selfish people than it does in being serving and selfless people. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, But know this, hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self. Now this is not referring to having a good sense of self or feeling good about yourself. This has to do with loving yourself so much that there's very little room for Jesus. And so I've written here, those full of themselves have little room for Jesus. In today's lesson, Paul presents another list. So yes, you're getting another list lesson this morning. But this list is going to stand in contrast to the other. So we have on one side this long list, which we looked at last week. It has to do with selfishness. It's a, a broad picture of what it likes to be self-serving, which is so applauded by our own nature and by culture. And then this counterculture, selflessness, one that serves others and that serves Christ. So if you turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll read this list, beginning in verse 10. It's not as long as the list from last week, so it will only be this morning's lesson. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, Faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in, Icon in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. <laughs> Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, and know those who taught you know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I want you to notice first on the list, Paul says, I want you to follow this in me, Timothy. And I thought about 2 Timothy as the last bit of advice that Paul gives to Timothy. <coughs> Most likely the last writing of Paul to Timothy as if you called someone to your bedside because you know that your time is coming. You pulled them to the side and said, this is my last opportunity to talk to you and here are some important things I have to tell you. The world is selfish. And it's going to be very tempting for you, Timothy, to be drawn in to serving yourself because that's what humans do. But you need to resist this as I've tried to do in my life and follow my example as one who serves Christ. And rather than being about myself, and in that way my heart is so crowded with myself there's no room for Christ, I'm going to have to expel myself from my heart and make room for Jesus. And in doing that, I will live a selfless life, a, a one who serves Jesus. One who is a lover of self will not follow anyone because he has all the answers. And here Paul commends Timothy for following him as he follows Jesus, similar to what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so here is the list then of things he says to follow. I'm sorry for the little puffs of air there. I'm not trying to do that. Follow my teaching. Follow my conduct. Follow my purpose. Follow my faith. Follow my patience. Follow my love. And follow my endurance. Let's look at each one of these this morning. First, follow my teaching. Now here are some variations from different translations. The Philip says, follow what I have taught. The message you have been a part of my teaching. The voice. You have been a good student. 
So as we think about each of these, we'll just make a brief comment about each one since it's kind of a longer list. Consider that the lover of God is one who is humble enough to listen. Because the selfish heart won't listen to people, to parents, to authority, to anyone. Not even to Jesus. He will think he has all the answers. His mind and his heart are just closed to what other people think. In contrast, the lover of God, the lover of Christ, will crave the teachings of Jesus. And as Paul writes here later in the same chapter, all scripture is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. And we'll look at these benefits in tonight's lesson. But for today, as we think about having hearts that are selfless, the first main quality that we follow from Paul that Paul tells Timothy to follow in him is his ability or willingness to listen to teachings. Follow my teachings. Secondly, follow my conduct. So here we have the, the perfect pair. Listening to, this, to the, the words of God, to the teachings, but also following a good example. You have closely observed how I lived, the voice said. You've been a part of my manner of life. You know how I live, says. So I like this comment from the studies in Timothy. It is always easier to imitate an example than to embrace the theory. Timothy had the dual advantage of accurate teaching and a vivid example. He had both. He had the right teaching and the right example. And those were powerful in producing disciples. William Barclay has written, the Christian life does not consist only in knowing something. It consists in being something. And so when we think about this list, it is important that we follow and listen, that we listen to teachings and that we also follow them, that we become something. Not only book learning, but a properly Christian life living out the truths of Jesus every moment of our lives. As the book of James says in James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Number three in the list, follow my purpose. You have followed my goal. You know my goal in life. You know what I want. Purpose. Now, um, like I do sometimes, I've been watching this television series called A.D. Kingdom and Empire. Um, it is about the first part of the book of Acts. I know it's just a dramatization, but I really enjoy um, shows like this because it draws me into the reality of what's happening. It's easy to read in the Bible and, and, and read about the persecutions of the early church. But when it's brought to life in a dramatization, it's totally different. And I'm just shocked. Because I think about the contrast that these men had, and women, in that they could perform miracles, but yet they were beaten. They were, they were thrown in, into prison, but yet the Holy Spirit spoke to them and, and guided them. And so there would be this, this contrast of, of God's power and human power seen in their own lives and, and how th this persecution could have been very difficult for them and upon them. The early Christians were very driven to their purpose and, and this show illustrated that. So here's an example of one of the scenes where Philip is baptizing someone from, from that series. And it just brought to mind how focused the early Christians were upon their purpose for being on the earth. And it convicted me as a selfish person by nature to realize that my life needs to look a lot more like the purpose of God rather than the purpose of Steve Powers. And so if we're going to be selfless people, we must tune our purpose to God's purpose rather than our own. 
What was Paul's purpose? What was Paul's manner of life? He said, for me to live is Christ. That was his purpose. In Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So what is our purpose? Jesus is our purpose. It's not about me. It's not about my own self and what I want. It is about Jesus. Number four, follow my faith. You know my faith in Christ. You know what I believe, but thou didst follow my faith. Faith is living for something greater than oneself. It is associated with our purpose. Faith is admitting dependency upon and reliance upon Jesus. I have faith in Him. I believe in Him. I follow Him. And my life is about Him. I have faith in Him. And so to remind us of this, let's sing the first verse of Living by Faith. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know Seen how I endure. 
You know my endurance. You saw my endurance. Thou hast fully known my patience. This last word rendered endurance or steadfastness or patience denotes a quality of fortitude in adverse conditions. And so as Paul finishes out his list, he says, if you follow Jesus by following my example, as I follow Jesus, you must commit to endurance. We all face deception, trickery, falsehood, Many of us will have to wrestle even with our own families with these things. When I consider the endurance of the early Christians, I'm going back to this series I've been watching. When I consider the endurance of the early Christians, I wonder if I'm a spiritual wimp. Because it doesn't take a whole lot of persecution to really deflate In Acts chapter 5, they called in the apostles and had them flogged, and they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they went on their way rejoicing. I think I might have whined and complained a little bit. But you see, that's what the selfish person does, not the selfless one. Paul says, along with persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. Can you see how the, the persecutions that come, that even in those, it's about taking us away from selfishness, self-reliance, self-cleverness, the ability to evade persecution or get away with it or whatever it is. Even in the midst of persecution, it's about reliance on Jesus. It's about selflessness. It's to say, I can't do this. God rescued me from this. All who want to live a godly life in Jesus will be persecuted. The events of this Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra are found in Acts chapter 13 through 15 when Paul and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey. Here's the map of where they, where they went to these cities. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 19, the Bible says some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they went over the crowd, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. Now we can just gloss over that. Oh, they threw rocks at him. They threw rocks at him and thought he was dead and dragged him out of the city and left him thinking, now the birds will come. But he wasn't dead. And so as Paul warns Timothy, he says, evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. And then these words, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So when we get this lesson, we talked about in the animal kingdom, how that there are self, there's selfishness and selflessness. They don't choose these things. They live these things by their nature. But we as human beings must choose which life we're going to live. Is it going to be about me or is it going to be about Jesus? Which will it be? Everything within myself and in the culture, my nature, will scream to me to live for myself. But God begs me to live for Jesus. The lover of Jesus surrenders himself to Jesus. He loves his enemies for Jesus. He turns the other cheek for Jesus. He suffers and is persecuted for Jesus. He forgives with abandon for Jesus. He loves Jesus more than he loves himself. Life is not about him. Life is about Jesus. So what will we choose? There may be someone here today who's never chosen Jesus. You can choose Him today. You can come and be baptized for the remission of sins and say, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus from now on and live by His purpose. If that's you, you do that. Or if you've just been lured into considering only the list of selfishness, 
rather than the list of loving Jesus. Make that change now. Understand these things you've heard.